Thank you so much for having me here. Thanks uh, to Pastor Wong Ying Ming and also Pastor Francis and the leadership team here for having me this morning. Uh, usually when I stand on the pulpit, usually uh, I stand in fear and trembling, delivering the word of God to the people of God. Uh, but this morning, uh, particularly, you know, I stand in the pulpit with greater fear and trembling because Pastor Yi Ming is my, was my former lecturer <laughs> in BCM. And I hope that she's not grading me today on the area of homiletics, which is the art of preaching, right? <laughs> Study of preaching this morning. Truly, I'm honored uh, to be here this morning, this beautiful church, our brothers and sisters here, right? This morning, I want to uh, entitle my sermon uh, on my slide, if you can. Uh, all the way for Jesus. All the way for Jesus. And I want to share from a familiar passage this morning in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, right? Uh, maybe you have a Bible. Can we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 7? In verse 1, it says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. How we need the grace of God today. Amen? Amen. My son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust the reliable people who will always also be qualified to teach others. Join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. In verse 5, similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. In verse 7, reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all this. Can we have a short prayer this morning? Father, we give you thanks, O God, for gathering us here together. It is for your honor, for your name, God, to be lifted up, O God, this morning. And I pray, God, that you anoint me, God, Lord, to deliver a message, O God, that is from you, God, not from the wisdom of men, so that, Lord, that this message that we, will, that we will run together, God, in this church and for me, myself, Lord, so that, Lord, we can live a life that will glorify you, God, and will please you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody say amen. All of you may agree with me this morning, or most of you would agree with me this morning, that we are living... Uh, sort of in the last days of the last days before the second coming of Christ. And, um, you know, we, um, we are living generally everywhere in the world in a, I, well, what, I, what many people call a post-Christian world, meaning that the doctrines that we hold, the Bible values that we hold, dear, so dear to us, uh, to the world, it may not be relevant. Um, it, it can be subjective to them or even divisive at this point of time. So therefore, we are to live a Christ-like life, to live a holy life, and to live a biblically correct life. Not political correct, right? But biblically correct life is becoming more and more challenging. Do you agree with me? Yes. It's becoming more and more challenging. And uh, even in, as you read further down to 2 Timothy, Paul was actually warning Timothy, about the perilous times that will come, the end time that will come, with this list of attitudes in the end time. I just want to read three, three of them to you. It's found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. And he says here, people will be lovers of themselves. People will be lovers of themselves. People will be lovers of money. And in verse 4, people will be lovers of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. What I call, it is a kind of a falling morality this, this morning today that we are living, the world that we are living in. A falling morality. 
And then we have uh, Jesus warning us uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. He says, because of the weak increase in wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. Uh, there are a lot of uh, going around, you know, debate about whether this many is the Christians or non-Christians or whatever it is. But the love of many, including us today, will get cold if we do not be careful this morning. So if we increase in wickedness, the love of many will grow cold. And there are many false teachings around today that we need to be careful of. And I want to just show you a slide this morning. Um, on, the, on the top part of the, the block there is the church. And then on the bottom is the world where there's fallen morality, there is increase in wickedness, and also some forty, a lot of false teachings. And today you see this picture. I want to challenge each one of us in this church that we don't, we don't let the church be influenced by the world. But rather the church must impact the world. Let us be impacting the world rather being influenced by the world. Like Romans chapter 12 verse 2 to 3 says. Let us not be conformed to the what pattern of this world, but rather be, rather be conformed by the renewing of our mind. Or to trans, be transformed, sorry, by the renewing of our mind. So that what? So that we can test and approve or discern what is the will of God in these days that we are living in. The will of God which is good, pleasing and perfect will of God. The passage that we have read just now, Paul reminded Timothy and reminded all of us that we needed to go all the way for Jesus in this time of challenge, challenges to endure suffering for Jesus. False teachers abound. If you read 1 Timothy, he called Timothy to station there to refute this false teaching. And in 2 Timothy, he wanted Timothy to leave the church and put some elders there. But in 2 Timothy, if you read further on, it talks about some people have left the faith, apostasy, left the faith. And one even uh, go against, went against Paul and the gospel. We have more and more, like these days, right? Apostasy, people leaving the faith. The deconstruction, the word, I don't know whether you're familiar with that word, you know. Deconstruction, in other words, it is backsliding. <laughs> and there are many of these challenges that are coming our way. But in view of this, Paul challenged Timothy. Paul challenged all of us in the Word of God that we have to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. We have to fight the good fight of faith going all the way for Jesus. Not only to live a Christ-like lives, not only to live a holy life for in this generation, but the, Paul was writing to Timothy to what? To pass on to reliable people so that they are able to qualify, they are qualified to teach others. So therefore, we do not pass what we hold dear to Tom, Dick, and Ronnie. You know? <laughs> We, we have to pass on to reliable people to the next generation. The next generation. And to impact the next generation today, church, we must not water down the gospel. We must protect our biblical values today by our very lives. By our very lives. So therefore, in... Therefore, Paul wrote to Timothy and says, Be strong, my son, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be strong, stand strong. So Paul uses three metaphors this morning I just want to bring to you. First of all, he likened us as a good soldier. Not only a soldier, but a good soldier. A good soldier endures suffering. Let me say this, that we are not today sailing on a cruise ship. You can, have, you can go for a cruise ship, cruise and whatever. But we are not, as spiritually speaking, we are not cruising on a, on a cruise ship. And we are not, we are actually on a battleship in that sense. 
We are not having fun in a playground. Yes, we can have fun on the playground with your kids. But we are actually on, at war spiritually on the battlefront, on the battleground. So therefore, as a good soldier, as a good soldier, there is a cost involved and there's a price that we need to pay. A soldier is required for long, hard training or maybe a deployment somewhere that you, must, that you, are, you have to get used to or you may not like. Uh, he has to forego comfort and convenience, uh, mental stress and pain he, has to, he or she has to go through. But a good soldier will not quit. A good soldier will not go MIA, missing in action. To me, a test of maturity is not the one who possess scripture knowledge, the one who has Greek and Hebrew, who can do devotion in Greek and Hebrew. It is not to me a maturity. A maturity is the one who endures suffering, who goes through suffering, but yet possesses the fruit of the Spirit. Amen. It's not just the knowledge, but those who endure suffering and yet really go through to possess the fruit of the Spirit. Maturity is the one who still pushes on when they're serving God, when it's so frustratingly difficult to do so. That is maturity. And to me, Paul, who went through many storms in his life, but yet he kept on serving the Lord. To me, Paul is an exemplar of a good soldier. I don't know what the cross we need to carry in the days ahead, for me and for you, or what the commands that the Lord Jesus will give each and every one of us, we do not know. We do not know what God will ask us to But the thing is, are we ready? Are we ready to go all the way for Jesus? A question we must ask ourselves this morning is, are we motivated by convenience or are we motivated by conviction of the call to be a good soldier. Today, we're living in a convenient culture, as all of us may, will agree with me. Convenient culture, which means we can tune off, tune on any time for church, for any preacher, just in a, by a click or by a touch or a scroll or a swipe or whatever it is, that we can tune on any time we want and we can also tune off anytime we want. Today we live in that kind of a convenient culture. Ever since Eugene Pauly created TV remote control in 1955, today we have gadgets explosion. Everything is at a click in a, at a, everything is at a click in a touch. Everything. Anything that is buffering over nine seconds, I, I get agitated. You get your phone and it's buffering over eight seconds. I will swipe and I scroll down. I don't know whether you, you, you are the same, right? I read recently a book, uh, Reaching Out to the Millennium. It was a few months ago. And uh, this author was saying that the attention span today, I mean, he was talking to the, our millennials, but I believe he's talking with adults as well, right? The attention span is lesser than a goldfish, which is nine seconds. I don't know whether you agree with me, but it's nine seconds, which means every eight seconds when Pastor Yin Ming is preaching, he has to do something to attract your attention. <laughs> every nine seconds. I, I did it and I just tested myself and I really, you know, you just get agitated after nine seconds. Evan Williams, I, I think you have the co-founder of Twitter said this, convenience decides everything. Easier is better, easiest is best. How true. Convenience decides everything. But let me share this, that convenience today will lead to compromise. You agree with me? Convenience will lead to compromise. But conviction to the call of God will lead to the commitment to the cause of Christ. Yes. Conviction to the call of God will lead us to, the commi to commitment to or committed to the cause of Christ. Great victories today are not done by 
you know, just people, you know, common people, but there are people who are good soldiers for Christ. Men and women who liken themselves as soldiers of Christ. They were, they're having conviction, commitment, and sacrifice. I read a poster once, and this is what it says, and I agree with it. And it says, strength and courage aren't always measured in medals and victories. They are measured in the struggles they overcome. The strongest people aren't always the people who win. They are the people who don't give up when they lose. They push it all the way. Push all the way. Not only a good soldier endures suffering, secondly, that he or she must not get entangled with civilian affairs or with the things of the world, instead focus on the mission at hand. The second one, yeah, the slide. We do not get in, entangled in a civilian's affairs, meaning the things of the world. Now, I'm not saying that we come out, you know, uh, we don't get involved in, it's not about involvement, right? We are all involved in the things of the world. If not, we'll be going, we, we call ourselves hermit, right? <laughs> Living in the caves or whatever. We are not, this is not talking about involvement with the things of the world. This is talking about entangling, to be entangled. The original word for this in Greek is empleko, meaning to weave in or woven in, which means you are locked in with the things of the world. And when God calls, you are not free to do what God calls us to do. You are entangled. And this is what it's exactly is all about. Do not be entangled in a civilian affairs as a good soldier. You can get involved, but not entangled. Get involved. Uh, so much, uh, get get uh, entangled so that you, can, you are not free to do what God calls you to do. Church, we are on a mission greater than us. Greater than us. Let us fix our eyes on the one who has called us to be good soldier. Our chief commander, Jesus. Amen. Let us focus on his kingdom. Let his kingdom come. Let his will be done on earth as in heaven. Let his name be magnified and glorified. Let his power and let his power come, empower us. Let his glory, all for his glory. And never let our eyes of Jesus Christ. Let me just read this article. I don't know whether you have read this before. I must just read it to you. And this art author or this article uh, writer, uh, maybe he's a soldier himself, right? But I'm not sure. But let me just read it to you. Author is unknown. He, he, he wrote this. He says, I'm a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. Faith, prayer, and the word are my weapons of warfare. I've been taught by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I'm enlisted for eternity. I will not get, get out, sell out, be talked out, or pushed out. I'm faithful, reliable, capable, dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I'm a soldier. I'm not a baby. I do not need to be pampered, petted, primed up, pumped up, picked up, pepped up. I am a soldier. No one has to call me, remind me, write me, visit me, entice me, and lure me. I am a soldier. I am not a wimp. I'm in place saluting my king, obeying his orders, praising his name, building his kingdom. No one has to send me flowers, gifts, food, cards, candy, or give me handouts. I do not need to be cuddled, cradled, cared for, or catered for. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. When Jesus called me into his army, I had nothing. If I end up with nothing, I will come out, uh, I still come out ahead. I will win. My God has and will continue to supply all my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I can do all things to Christ. The devil cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. 
Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. Money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. Hell cannot handle me. I am a soldier. Even death cannot destroy me. When a commander calls me from his battlefield, he will promote me to be captain, allow me to rule with him. I'm a soldier in the army of God and I'm marching, claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I am a soldier marching heaven bound. Here I stand. Would you stand with me? Wow. When I read this, I am... <laughs> I'm humble, truly humble. Can I be what this guy has written? Second metaphor, Paul challenges Timothy and all of us to go. All the way for Jesus is an athlete. In fact, it's a picture of a champion athlete because he is bent on, he or she is bent on winning the race. Bent on winning the race. I discovered in ancient times only one runner or one pe person in the games or whatever it is gets the glory or gets the prize. There's no bronze or there's no silver. Only one which means winning the race or nothing. In 1 Corinthians 9.24, Apostle Paul challenges, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? He says, run in such a way as to get the prize. Get the prize. Get the prize. In verse 5, as you read just now, he says, compete according to the rules to get the victor's crown. A competing... A, 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 uh, uh, according to the rules. What rules? What rules that we're talking about? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, give us the, down to 3, give us the answer. He says, run the race, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the author, the beginner, the founder of our faith, and also the perfecter, the finisher, the end of our faith. The rule here is to run with your eyes on Jesus. With Jesus or without Jesus, that is our, that is the, the, the rules. That is the rules. The focus is, the focus for us in starting the race that all of us have started when you, uh, we, when you gave your life to Jesus. And the focus to end it well is none other than Jesus himself. So let us, church, not deviate. Let us not detour. But more importantly, let us not detach from the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 15, abide in the vine. Let us not detach, please, from this race. Because we are called to be champion athletes, run to win for Jesus Christ. So don't take the race lightly. The question we need to ask ourselves, how do you view this race of yours? How do you wield it? I was one in a particular college um, and to get the certificate, I need to finish this fitness course, right? Fitness course. And um, you have to uh, run a certain distance, about maybe 2 km or something to finish and get a cert, right? Uh, in this college, you have to finish it before you can get the final thing. And when you're running, uh, when, when, when we call to run uh, to finish the course, we get some people together and get a fellow friend, a, a fellow friend who has a motorcycle. <laughs> and what we do is, we, what we did was when we, we will ran for a few minutes, all right, and then meet this guy <laughs> somewhere and we took every, he will took everyone, you know, one by one to a destination where we have our coffee and tea, right? And after that, We'll finish the race, but we have to pretend, right? We have to pretend to finish the race. Wow, 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 you know, it was quite, uh, it's quite uh, convincing, right? But let us not cheat on our race, right? Let us treat our race lightly. And that was uh, before I became a Christian. Huh? After you look at me, <laughs> what did Ronnie do, right? The way you run your race will depend on how you view this call of yours? Is this the ultimate call of your life? Or is it just a volunteer work? Just in this church, I just serve a little if I have convenient time in whatever it is. But is it the ultimate call of your life? The apostle called Paul 
treat it as an ultimate call. In fact, he would do anything not to disqualify from it. He says here in 1 Corinthians 9.27, I strike a blow in the next... Uh, well, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. So after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the price. He treats us at the ultimate price, uh, ultimate call. He kept fighting, he kept pushing, and so must we. Amen? The third metaphor Paul said about going all the way for Jesus is to be a hard-working farmer. Um, what's the difference between the first two pictures and this picture? I put a, deliberately a woman here because in the race for God, there's no gender. Amen? Amen? There is men and women going on for the Lord, boys and girls, if you to run this race for Jesus. There will be no shortcut for a good farmer. He will wake up in the early, he or she will wake up early in the morning, till the ground, till the hard ground, plant, water, did everything, the technique that he knows, that he or she knows how. Then he waits patiently for favor of God. There will be no shortcut if you want to taste the harvest. There is no shortcut. In the corporate world, we have heard that we sh you should work smart and not work hard. But in the kingdom of God, we also work smart. But we also work hard. Amen? We also work hard. And Paul, as I read, doing a devotion on, uh, in the book of Acts, Paul was saying, I work hard to do this. I work hard to do that. We work smart and we also work hard. What a joy, church, to give in a taste of harvest when we did all that we can, all the blood, sweat, and tears, and we get the taste of the harvest. At this time, I want to conclude by summarizing two main points of these three metaphors. Good soldier, champion athlete, and hard-working farmer. The first one is, of course, perseverance. Perseverance. The tenacity to complete what we call to do. The tenacity to complete what we call to do. Go all the way to the finish line in our race for Jesus. The work and ministry that we do in this church and in beyond this church is not a job. We are not hiring, amen? We are not hiring or merely volunteers, but we are called by the Almighty God. We served, the, we, are, we are doing or we serve, the, we're doing the greatest work for a greatest person in the whole of universe, God Himself. God Himself. And know that our God will not leave us alone, amen? He sends the Holy Spirit empower us when we do His work. He will strengthen us. He will be our ever-present help in trouble. When we think we cannot do it anymore, I have many times think that I cannot do it anymore, but He just lifts you up. He just lifts you up. If you think that you're dry this morning, He will fill your cup. Amen? He will love you and He will put you forward. He will strengthen you so you can go all the way for Jesus. God the Father turned away from Jesus for a brief moment on the cross. The Father of God even though He is able to send legions of angels to help Jesus, His Son. But He did not because He went all the way for all of us. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane prayed that prayer and all of us know that prayer. Lord, not my will. Father, not my will, but Yours be done. Uh, ten years ago, I was, in, I was leading a group uh, in, to Israel we were at the tail end of our journey, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, this place, they said, was the, really the exact place where Jesus was praying. Or I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's uh, near the well, you know. It was, it was caught on off and all these things, right? But uh, somehow, I don't know how, we got to get into the well there, right? Four of us, I don't know how, right? We knelt down. We knelt down on, a, on, a, on that well and we prayed the same prayer as Jesus. Father, 
not my will, but yours be done. But after that, we rose up and enjoyed the rest of the tour. <laughs> Jesus knelt there and prayed that prayer, and we, when he rose up, he was tortured and crucified. He gave, he went all the way for us. Amen. The Holy Spirit will go all the way for us until the gospel of this kingdom shall be preached to all the earth and then the end will come. He will let the church continue on, be strong, to, to challenge us to be strong and to always remember the harvest field. Always remember the harvest field. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go all the way and so must we. Therefore, endure suffering like a good soldier until we are called home, until our deployment by Jesus is completed. Run in such a way, however tired you may be today. I told the churches, right? Crawl you if you must to the finish line. Crawl if you must to the finish line. Toil in the farm of God. Even though you may not see the harvest yet, set everything in place. Let the grounds be tilled. Let the, let the sowing be done. Let, the, let it be watered. And wait for God for the final results. And the second point is that we will have a victorious end. We will have a victorious end. As a good soldier, we may not understand the whole picture of what God is doing. Even when I read the beginning of the war, you know, I do not know what happened. I've been praying every day, tears and all these, you know, for the people in the Middle East. What will happen? I do not have the answers for everything. But let's be assured that at the end of it all, Jesus will triumph. Jesus will triumph. I don't know how you're feeling this right today in this dark, dark world. It's getting darker, sorry to say that. But eventually, Jesus will triumph. I don't know some of the hardships that you're going through right today. Jesus knows, God sees. And eventually, Jesus will triumph. The book of Revelation was not given just to complete the Bible. The Revelation was written so that it will be an encouragement to those who are going through persecution. Yeah. To encourage people and also to come with a warning too as well that we need to go all the way for Jesus. To go all the way, Jesus. Aren't you glad that God allowed you and me to be part of His great scheme of things? Yeah. God doesn't need us. But God allows us to be partners with Him in a great scheme of things. I remember my life before I became a Christian. I was giving up my life as a young man, you know, with no direction, self-esteem, a bullet in school, uh, you know, all these. And God took me from the miry pit, exactly what when I read Psalm, you know, you took me from a miry pit to be where I am today. I'm forever grateful, friends forever grateful to what God has done in my life, in my life. A champion athlete for Christ, we will receive a crown that will never fade. All the trophies that I've earned in school are all gone. But the crown that Jesus gives us will never, will never fade away. Amen? They were given to all of us, witness in His kingdom. Uh, lastly, a hard-working farmer shall taste the harvest at the end. You may not see it in this generation, maybe. I pray that I can see great harvests or revivals. But if I cannot see it, I believe there will be a next generation that God will do a miracle, do his, uh, get His harvest done. But the end of it all, the end of it all, do not go, do whatever that you do without Jesus without Jesus. Let us persevere. Persevere and fix our eyes on Jesus. He who began a journey with us will hold our hands until the finish line. I pray that all of us will say like Apostle Paul at the end of his journey, the last slide please. 
2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 to 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is a store for me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. Not only to me, but also to Pastor Yingming, Pastor Francis, Pastor, or the pastors, or the, everyone, all who have longed for His appearing. Now this is not just waiting there and long for His appearing and then you get a crown, right? This is about running the race, pushing on, doing you know, what God wants us to do, the call, that long for that crown at the end of the day that kept Paul going on. I have finished the race. Let us pray this morning. Yeah. Amen.